Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. Did you know that you are paying 10 times too much for your electricity, and that if you used existing technology, you could have it at a price that whoever generated it could ill afford to meter it because we just flat rate it into your homes at say $20 a month? The key to prosperity is to get the government out of the energy regulating business. Insight into why we are overregulated with absurd standards are going to be developed during this talk. And we're going to make some suggestions that we, you, me, can do to regain prosperity. Question, should the public be concerned about safety of nuclear power? The answer is very simple, no. It is inherently safe. The media is misrepresenting the case. The media comes out and they, articles like this on the front page of the Argonian on Mother's Day. A Hanford worker with his mask and his coveralls, a diagram of putting what they call high-level waste 3,200 feet deep into solid basalt. What they have labeled waste are the plutonium resources of the future. Should we talk about a reactor to which people are often exposed? The sun is an operating thermonuclear reactor 93 million miles away far enough away that the energy it deposits on the Earth is one kilowatt on one square meter in an hour. One of those neat ones, and you can always remember that. So when somebody tells you that uh, the sun's good for you, you have to believe them because it sustains all life on Earth. If they tell you that looking at the sun without colored glasses, in other words, with a naked eye, 10 seconds, if you stare at that sun, not in an eclipse, it will burn the retina of your eye. Multiple exposures to the sun can cause cancer, does cause cancer. If you lie naked on the desert long enough, it will kill you. And yet, as I walked past the swimming pool just a little while ago, there were sunbathers out there. Minimum of attire, shielding, if you will, absorbing energy from the sun, that reactor up in the sky. And this reactor burns the skin, otherwise the skin would not suntan. Suntan is just like good cooking. It's a controlled burn. And the sunbathers and you and I have no fear of the sun. Those of us who get exposed to the sun realize that a white shirt and a cowboy hat are all that is required to keep us from getting burned. And if we want more sun, we just roll up our sleeves and pick up a little brown on the arms. May I submit, at this stage, nuclear reactors are no different. They give off the same kinds of energy, and they're useful for the same purpose. The only thing that makes them different is that they have a higher power density. How can nuclear radiation harm you? Will it hurt you? Yes, if it comes from an atomic blast, if it comes from an unshielded nuclear reaction, or if it is in the hands of a doctor. Otherwise, it's pretty acceptable. An atomic blast. When we say this, why well, you see the Hiroshima and Nagasaki mushroom clouds. Did you know? 
that 18 Japanese civilians survived Hiroshima, made their way to Nagasaki, and survived that one also three days later. One of these guys was a Japanese newspaper editor. And he went to the mayor of Nagasaki and he says, those Yanks have really got something this time. They've got a bomb that announces itself with a flash of light. And if you hurry and get something between you and that flash, you can survive. The Japanese, in less than three days, had learned a lesson that we have not yet learned in 40 years. This lesson is briefly Stop looking at the blast, drop down and make as small a target out of yourself as you can in a ditch behind a rock, and roll under something if it's available to keep debris from falling upon you. Great big debris, the kind that will crush you and snuff out your life. This story was told to the policeman in Nagasaki. Do you know how many people were, policemen were injured at Nagasaki or killed? None. They listened, heard the story once, and they took action, protected themselves. The police chief's son and three companions were on their way to school at 8.15 that morning. The boy saw the flash, grabbed one of his companions, and dove into a shelter. The other two boys stood there gawking and were blown away, never seen again. There are the quick and the burn. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. When you've seen it, you've had it. The nuclear radiation from an atomic blast, when you've seen it, you've had it. There's not any more of any consequence coming. Sound travels at sea level about 750 miles per hour. That's roughly a mile in five seconds. So coming behind the light flash, at the speed of sound is a heat and pressure wave that's hot in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's going to burn anything that gets in its way unless something deflects it over you. May I submit that what they're doing in Russia right now is a pretty good trick. A fallout shelter, a blast shelter, or whatever you want to call it in Russia is just a slope-sided trench with railroad ties across it, not spaced so closely that you can't run and dive headlong into this thing to protect yourself. If the flash of light is two miles away, you have only 10 seconds to take cover. Would you volunteer to take 11? Wouldn't be too wise. Five? Yeah, that'd be about right, because you could keep your head down. How long are you going to keep your head down? You consult the Army training manual, and it says that after the echo waves subside, you know, nature abhors a vacuum, bounces back and forth a few times, and there's a thunder and lightning and a great deal of fuss. But when that part of it is over, you get up and go do your assigned duty. That's what the Army training manual says. It only says one thing that's inconsistent, and it's fed into it by the Health Physics Society. It says, record your dose. I will submit that it is recorded on the human dosimeter, and that if you don't have a suntan, a burn, you don't have a problem. Unshielded nuclear reaction. The record is not perfect. This chart shows you that there have been 34 accidents from unshielded nuclear reactions in this country up to 1967. This is recorded in Los Alamos document 3611. In six of these accidents, eight people died. Now on the chart, it only shows five deaths. Those are the red lines that go below the horizontal axis, representing deaths, of course, from burns. Where's three of them? Three of them died at SL1 in Idaho in the 1950s when one guy pulled the control rods manually out of an Army test reactor 
The thing went critical, developed steam pressure, and drove the control rods like harpoons through them and stuck them to the overhead. So they don't count as radiation burn deaths because they didn't die from radiation burns. They died from being harpooned. General Electric Company, for whom I worked 26 years, went in and decommissioned that site so that it just looked like a patch of sand and gravel in Idaho. The first reactor decommissioning. And what a miserable thing to do. Why did they do it? So that they'd never be reminded of their failure to maintain control of the nuclear genie. Now this nuclear genie is pretty fierce. You let it get out of control and it can burn you. Five of those guys died from real accidents. One of them was tickling the dragon's tail, taking half of a critical mass in one hand and half in another, and on a ratchet device, figuring out how close you could get them together before you get a blue flash. He got a blue flash all right, but he was sitting fumbling with a screwdriver trying to get them apart. And this blue flash, in a millisecond, can burn you. In the millisecond that the thing was in critical position, it was trying to drive itself apart, but because he had it on a ratchet device, it wouldn't. So it burned him badly. He walked away and he said, if I'd had a quick release on that thing, it wouldn't have burned me. 39 hours later, he was dead. He walked away knowing that he was going to die. The first one. And the second one was taking little cubes of enriched fuel material and building what he thought was a geometric shape that would do the job. And he was building a cube with cubes. And he had this thing built up and he came over it with one cube and dropped it accidentally into the middle. That was the magic one. It went critical. It exceeded the amount of material that had to be so that you could get neutrons absorbed and make an unlimited chain reaction. The air in the room turned blue. There were other people in the room. He thought because the one that he dropped and made it go critical, he took the time to go after the one that was in the middle. It was very hot. It took time. How would he supposed to have stopped the reaction? And he realized that later. All he had to do was hit the whole stack with the heel of his hand and it would have gone away. That meant that he didn't even have to run away from it. Forty hours later, he was dead. We could go on to the other accidents, but the point is you mishandle the nuclear genie and he'll kill you. The safety record for this is not perfect. Those who pretend that it is are the ones that say that 50 plus people kill building wasting towers. They call them cooling towers. I call them wasting towers at a reactor. Were killed in one fell swoop when a sca scaffold broke. And they said that didn't have anything to do with nuclear power. Oh, it didn't? That's the device that the opposition used to throw over 50% of the heat away without using it. You bet it has to do with this thing. And they killed over 50 men one afternoon. They don't talk about it, do they? The sun can burn. All you got to do is go out there without a white shirt on and it'll burn you. Repeated exposures can cause cancer. Except that daily exposure is required for good health. What are you then going to do about Navy nuclear submariners who run submerged for months on end? What are they going to do? They have in a package a reactor that two of us could reach around, fueled with fully enriched uranium, and this thing is fueled so that it will last for the expected operational life of that undersea boat, 17 to 20 years. It will run at speeds in excess of 35 knots submerged. And they depend upon it for their light, their heat, their mobility, their air, their water, and their suntans. And to get a suntan, all you have to do is hook up a sun lamp or if they didn't put so cotton picking much shielding on that reactor, they could just walk up to the reactor and kind of sunbathe in it. 
to get their ultraviolet light. Now, doctors. Doctors burn people to cure cancer in cobalt therapy centers. If it doesn't burn, they don't cure cancer. I have a sheet of paper here of a federal register where they gave a person who had just had a lung removed five shots. They were to give them five shots of 400 R each. Now look on the chart to realize how much 400 is and realize that the scale is marked off in logarithmic functions. One, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000. A doctor exposes people in the 7,000 to 10,000 Rentkin range to burn cancer cells preferentially because they are faster growing than normal cells. At that point, you say, on this experiment, five doses of 400 R each. They made a computer mistake. Instead of giving all five doses at 400, they gave two at 400 and three at 800 R each for a total accumulative dose of 3200 R instead of 2000. The NRC held a special safety investigation. Their doctor says that there were no significant observable effects on that patient of increasing individual doses by a factor of two and the accumulative dose from 2000 to 3200 and that the NRC reviewed it and found out that their report was quite correct. There were no significant effects. Then I submit there was no cure because unless they burned that body, there was no effect. In 1967, I attended a seminar in Berkeley that was taught by Bob Stewart from, from across the bay. Uh, can't even think of the name of the university. Stanford. And Bob had some pictures of women who had been treated for uterine cancer with uh, strong bursts of gamma energy, delivered in a short time, the point that they would burn. And there were several women in the group, and we just had a fine buffet dinner. And when the women saw these pictures, a good fraction of them went outside and regurgitated their food because it made them ill just to look at the burned purple skin on these women who had had cancer cured. Now since gamma is preferentially absorbed in the skin on the surface, like suntans now, and because it's the shortest wavelength, highest frequency of the ultraviolet spectrum, then if you get enough dose deep enough in the body to burn, you're going to burn the skin, maybe even turn it purple to cure what's deeper inside the body. If you don't want to do it that way, then you go to radi radium implants like the old doctors used to, and I find out that some of them still today use that technique. Now, you can get burned how? In an atomic blast, in an unshielded nuclear reaction, or at the hands of a doctor for which you get to pay with the approval of the Federal Drug Administration and the American Medical Association. What about if you're a non-nuclear worker, just ordinary people around an island like Three Mile Island in the Susquehanna River in near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1979? Should you be afraid? The media went in there and blew that thing entirely out of proportion. They had people evacuating as far away as New York City to get away from that. And yet I submit that Jimmy Carter and his wife going there a week later did not display courage. If it was as bad as to have all the people that lived around the island evacuating, what was the President of the United States doing in that control room? The stage show on TV called Saturday Night Alive saw through that whole sham. The writers wrote the Pepsi syndrome. Remember it? They had it. It was all pretense. There is nothing wrong with that reactor. The skilled, dedicated crew couldn't have turned around in two to six weeks and put it back online 
in April of 1979. Six and a half years later, almost, it's still offline. Sitting next to it was Three Mile Island One, a perfectly operatable reactor down for refueling. It's still down for refueling. It's been fully staffed, fully fueled, fully operable for six and a half years, and it's never generated any power. It's a net consumer of power and dollars, roughly a million dollars a day for TMI-1, another million dollars a day for TMI-2 for six and a half years. Somebody figure that out for me and tell me what it is. It's a whole lot of dollars. Do you know how they replace the power? They buy it from Ontario Hydro in Canada at 80% of their cost of generation and sell it for 120 to 125% of what it would cost them with the approval of their public utility commission. How can they afford to leave two reactors already operationally tested down for six and a half years? Good question, isn't it? On that particular point, the company for which I work, E.J. Crosby and Associates, volunteered to go in and pull the core on that reactor, lay it out on the deck, because six and a half years later, you can handle it barehanded. Just lay it out on the deck and demonstrate to the world that there's nothing wrong with that reactor. I made that observation that that was the case in 1979 to Battelle Memorial Institute, for whom I worked at the time. They said, oh no, 20% of that core is just mangled. No, they took the head off that reactor on the 24th of July last year. They looked down into perfectly clear water, and guess what they saw? A reactor that hadn't been physically damaged at all, other than to have a few fuel pins perfed, burst. It's not melted. The fuel is removable. And so I'm going to go to the Congress and say to them, if that fuel is like I said it was six years ago, remotely replaceable, I get to keep the fuel. You need to give me a few million dollars to pay for this little exercise, and you need to give me permission to go in there and do it. My company, E.J. Crosby, and I have access to the Lower Columbia Basin Search and Rescue Unit, 15 trained scuba divers, and we'll go in there and we'll pull that fuel out by hand this long since shutdown, and put it in buckets, if that's where you want to see it. But we get to keep the fuel. And if it's really like I say it is, we get to keep the whole island. And if we have the whole island, we'll show you how to run it. How will we run it? At 100% available power. In other words, run it over nameplate rating enough days out of the year that while we're down for refueling, it still won't put it below 100%. If you think that the island is too contaminated, we'll turn on the fire hose and flush it down like the Navy does its ships at sea. Wow. Can you imagine what trouble I'm going to get into when I go to Congress with that one? Now, ultraviolet light energy is preferentially absorbed in the skin. If you ingest it, it's supposed to burn you, be harmful to you. In Brazil, tomatoes grow on monzonite sands that have high thorium content. It turns out that these tomatoes, if you slice them, that come from Brazil and you lay them down on a film packet, they'll take their own radio autograph. Does that sound like what that neat woman, Marie Curie, did a few decades ago? That's what she did. She had a rock like this, and she uh, laid it next to some film, and when she developed the film, it was smudged because it had been close to a rock like this. Marie Curie did that a number of years ago. Here we are, all of these decades later, hanging film badges around radiation workers to tell when they've had too much exposure. Oh, isn't that great? Can you imagine what happened in the fall of 76 when I went back to Hanford after running an ore buying station in Colorado where we handled rocks like this every day and I didn't take my pet rock out of my pocket and they hung one of their film badges on? We burnt that film badge black in less than a week. 
Who had the highest exposure in Hanford on the fall of 76? I did. You know what they did? They assembled an August review board of five managers, and they decided that since I didn't get that exposure doing work out there, that they'd write my total whole body exposure for 25 years of work to zero. I interrogated the computer, and that's the way it came out. Okay. There's a story available, I hope it got passed out, on They Also Serve, which is the effect of hanging these kind of dosimeters around somebody's neck and saying, go maintain that reactor. I'm going to tell you that such things as that are ridiculous. Now this chart over here says that 60 R per hour delivered to living human cells, the human cells self-repair during the time of exposure. Those who don't make it die. Those who self-repair live. Then I'll submit that 60 R per hour is the lower level of concern. The federal regulation is 60 micro R per hour for off-site dose from a reactor. That's a million times less than that that has no effect on human cells. Then we rapidly get to the conclusion that the federal safety regulations are absurd. They are meaningless, except that they cost us free use of the nuclear option. They are a billion times too conservative, to which I say our ability to measure has exceeded our ability to understand. If you haven't been burned, what is your problem? We go back to the standard that was in existence before 1934, before the International Commission on Radiation Protection headquarters in Vienna, Austria, imposed a standard that says X-ray handling, gamma ray handling, can no longer be allowed to burn anyone. We're going to install a standard of two-tenths of an R per day. How much is two-tenths of an R per day? It's less than one billionth of one calorie, of which we probably ate over a million for lunch today. You say, no, no, I just ate a thousand calories for lunch today. No, I say that you ate a thousand kilocalories for lunch today, large C, not lower C. And these people then want to regulate the radiation that comes from materials that are used in a reactor to less than a billionth of a millionth of the food content that you ate today for lunch. Heat equivalent. Aren't they nice people? What are they doing? They're using technical razzle-dazzle to confuse you because you don't understand orders of magnitude, powers of 10, and exponential functions. The safety standards have been set at the level of detection, not at the level of hazard. And we've let them get away with it. Them who? the majority of the Congress, all of the people in the bureaus of the government. Well, I had this figured out a long time ago, and last December I was working on cutting up a steam generator that should have been cut up in Virginia six years ago, and I had a neat tool that would do it, and I had my crew of men working at it out at 300 area in Hanford, and I was making it look so easy that Battelle, Pacific Northwest Laboratory managers, decided they would conspire against me. So I took one of my tools back to the shop. It was contaminated with cobalt-60, but in a exempt quantity. In other words, if you got an exempt quantity of cobalt-60, which is a microcurie, if a piece that you have is less than that, then you can do anything you want, including eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. Eat it. I can't even talk tonight. Anyway. I took that tool to the shop and worked on it, and I brought it back out to the plant, and the plant manager saw it the next morning, and he says, 
where's that tool been? I said, it's been in my shop. Isn't that the one I saw downstairs yesterday? I says, yes, it is. He says, for that, I shut the job down, I cancel your contract, and I'm throwing you off site. For what? Less radioactivities than on a watch dial. But it came from his plant, and what it was, was I was in danger of exposing their fraud, their deception. They're spending $10 million to sample that steam generator, which wasn't needed in the first place, in Richland in a special building, a fortress built so that they could control the radioactivity, and it could have been sampled in a tent on the beach in Virginia six years ago and accomplished the same thing. Exposure to radioactivity, indeed. I was exposing them to the bright light of sunshine, and they didn't like it. Anyway, they sent a couple of radiation monitors and a manager down to my shop to survey for cobalt-60. And I, I'm a rascal. I walked in with a bottle of uh, uranium oxide like this, and I said, uh, poured some of it out in my hand like this. Oh, we've got to play a couple of games first. See what it counts through the bottle? Gamma is supposed to be the most penetrating of all radiation. Is it? That glass bottle is holding it out. Look what happens when I tip it over to the lid without the plastic on top. Most penetrating of all radiation, it can't even get out of a glass bottle. You see? I poured some out in my hand like this. And I said, survey it. And I stuck it out in front of their Geiger counter, and their Geiger counter went off third scale like mine just did. And then I smeared it all over where they were surveying. And he complained. And I says, don't complain to me. You got 100,000 times more than you had before. Just get back to your survey. And I poured some out in my hand like this, and we got into a tip about whether ingestion of it would hurt. And uh, I did differently than I'm going to do now, but and I swallowed it. And I splashed it all over my face, so I got it in my lungs and in my eyes. And I said, what's wrong with you people? Have you lost your mind? It blew their mind. They took off out of there like scalded apes. Anyway, radioactive material outside its container is radioactive contamination. You got that? If you scoop it back up, then I just decontaminated Galen Windsor's hand. The amount of radioactivity that I have on my hand is a reportable incident in Hanford, Washington. The Department of Energy says if it's detectable, we have to report it to the newspapers. There are several ways to get that off my hand. One of them is to wash it, but if you wash it, it has to go down a controlled drain according to the federal regulations. I'm going to ask the question, do I qualify as a controlled drain? Must be. Now, the difference between high-level waste and low-level waste. High-level waste is self-heating. It's detectable on a Geiger counter. I submit that I am not low-level waste because I am self-heating and I am radioactive. The federal regulations require that high-level waste be buried 3,200 feet deep in basalt. Now do you know why, when I did this at Hanford, that they turned out a federal SWAT team to get me on orders of the NRC in Walnut Creek, California, NRC Region 5, Bob Thomas by name, issued a federal warrant for my arrest. And so the SWAT team came out with a picture, and you know it's not too hard to find a picture of Galen Windsor. They even got him in trim bulletins nowadays. It said on there, this is an irrational individual. 
he poses a threat to our security, take him at any cost. How did I pose a threat to their security? I was taking a hot sword called truth and I just poked it in their hot air balloon and their fraud was about to be exposed and that worried them. The state of Washington set two of their Gestapo agents, they call them radiation protection people, those that would keep us from using the nuclear genie, over to audit Battelle's survey. They came into my home and they said, we are here to confiscate your uranium. And I said, after I'd given them a little de demonstration, the only way that you'll ever get to touch my uranium samples again is with a court order. They went to get the court order. They never got it. I told their boss where to go via my state representative, Ray Isaacson, who had been handling uranium and plutonium and fission products with me for 35 years. Ray's been fighting a losing battle in the legislature in Washington, and I've been fighting a losing battle in Illinois for years. Ray took the position a long time ago that uh, low-level waste are just ordinary material. If they are less than economically recoverable amounts, then you just flush them down the sewer or throw them away in the dump. He did that in 1981 in the state legislature, made a big presentation on it, got all kinds of backing, and they never did anything with it. And the next year, he never even made the presentation because somebody got to him and hit him over the head and says, uh-uh, you don't do that. Now, let me tell you a story about low-level waste. If you declared it non-hazardous and just threw it away like that, all you'd have to do is sit still and listen to see who howls the loudest. The truckers who get paid for hauling it across country at 32 cents a ton mile, which is a fair rate of pay, incidentally. That's what it was five years ago. I don't know what it is now. Or the people who conceal legal evidence in 55-gallon drums by hanging a radioactive sign on the side, yellow and magenta, filling out a radioactive shipment record by one RSO, radiation safety officer, and dumping it into a federally mandated non-inspectable system. I'll tell you that organized crime uses that of getting way, getting away from their evidence, from that that would convict them. It outmodes concrete overshoes in the Chicago River by a whole great big bunch. Low-level waste is a tool of those who oppose progress in total. They're backed up by a legal system and regulations that don't make any sense. Proliferation control of weapons. Remember when the Israelis took out a reactor in Iraq? They had fully enriched U-235 supplied by France and they were accused of being, going to uh, take that fully enriched uranium, put it into a reactor, convert it into plutonium. They were going to recover the plutonium and make weapons out of it. Now, anybody that believes that that's what Iraqi was going to do with that fully enriched uranium doesn't know that fully enriched uranium makes a better weapon than plutonium does. I will submit that four years ago over South Africa, that flash over Madagascar was a fully enriched uranium bomb made by the South Africans by laser isotopic enrichment techniques. And if South African can do it, anybody else can. They're a slightly disorganized nation. They got political problems. If they can gather up the resources to make a fully enriched U-235 weapon, then where does Jimmy Carter get off saying you can transfer fully enriched U-235 to India, but you can't transfer them any plutonium, because if they get plutonium, they'll make a weapon out of it. Ridiculous. Now, if you're going to control 
bombs in the hands of terrorists, then obviously you're going to ban all of the uranium on Earth and all of the lasers. Because anybody that knows the activation energy of U-235 as compared to U-238 can gather up the material to make a weapon. I know where there's pet rocks like this. This one's 16 weight percent uranium in northwest Saskatchewan, just laying on the surface of the ground where you can dig them with a front end loader. And that's where France gets its uranium. Got an article here that says that uranium is in short supply. Don't waste it. By 1965, we had enough uranium stacked as UF-6 at Paducah, Kentucky to last us from now on. It was 1975 when I was running a uranium ore buying station, and I couldn't figure out why GE gave me $6 million just to buy uranium when there was already enough out of the ground. That's when I found out about an international cartel called NUEXCO, Nuclear Exchange Company, that regulated the price of uranium worldwide. And when I wanted to find out how much to pay the uranium miners over there, I called San Jose. and they would tell me what the new exco price was and one time i called in and i says what's the new exco price now what am i paying my miners and they said kent haas whom i went to college with in 1950 passed the phone over to a new exco guy and he says here ask him in other words i had the head man on the phone calling from colorado to find out what i was supposed to spend ge's money on i had a sneaking feeling that i was in a sneaky business I decided to get out, and so I resigned and went home. Okay, several myths. This pet rock won't burn you, but federal regulations, 10 CFR 61, says it has to be buried 30 feet deep so that a stumbler prospector 100 years from now won't find it and get burned. Now, if it won't burn you now, how's it going to burn you? a hundred years from now, or somebody else, it won't be you, or it won't be me, because we're not going to be around. How would it burn them then, if it won't burn now? If gamma is the most penetrating of all radiation, how come it doesn't count? How come it doesn't count very much, as compared to how it counts right there? You suppose they've been lying to you? They've been misrepresenting about this energy that comes off here? I'll bet you they have. You've heard it said that uh, five grams of plutonium properly distributed over the face of the Earth will kill everybody on Earth. Well, I doubt it. I took this out of a film can. Let's put it back in. And turn the counter on again. Doesn't count very much, does it? That's the reason you put film in a can, is to keep it from being exposed from gamma activity. You'll find out the Department of Transportation rules say you got to protect film and people to the same standard. That's ridiculous. They've got people limited to what they ship film in, and they put film in cans like this. What they're really saying is to ship people on airplanes, you got to put them in cans like this too. Is it radioactive? When I get it out and count it, it's not radioactive, it's very radioactive. It has a density of 19. There are two elements that have density 19. One of them is uranium, the other is plutonium. And I submit that outside of a laboratory, you can't tell whether this is uranium, plutonium, or a mixture of the two. Is it pyrophoric? Yeah, it is. Pyrophoric means that I can strike sparks off it. Those hot particles that were flying around there was reactor fuel melting, burning. And if it's plutonium, I just contaminated this area right here in excess of the EPA's limit for one square mile. Go tell the NRC on me. Say that I've broken the EPA's limit. 
I'm going to climb on an airplane in the morning and go home, and I'm going to have this thing in my wallet. What then? I've just broken the federal regulations, because it says as you go on to past the security point there that radioactive materials are hazardous in any amount. There are no amounts designated. And when I carry me on, because I've been eating uranium, I'm also forbidden. I'm breaking the federal regulations. What are they going to do? If they know it, they're going to fine me $10,000 and put me in jail for a year. And I've been doing it for 14 months on lecture tour. If it's a year per occasion, I'm in deep trouble. What am I telling you? That the federal regulations are ridiculous, absurd. In my hand, Coleman gas mantles. Did you know they were radioactive? Someone said the other day, if Galen Windsor's got them, we know they're radioactive. <laughs> What do you do with a Coleman gas mantle? Well, you put it on a, a lantern and you light a match to it, turn on the gas and light another match and heat it up to white incandescence. And if while it's off, the children reach their hands in and macerate the mantle, what you do is you whop the children on the bottom, complain about the cost of putting a new mantle on, and go through the same process again, but nobody, but nobody goes and washes the child's hand because they've got radioactive material on them, thorium oxide. Back to our story. Is radioactive fallout harmful to you? Remember how long you stay down? Till after the echo waves stop bouncing. What about the stuff that falls from the sky? Any problem? No, not really, because it's oxide created at white incandescent temperatures. So oxides are not soluble. This stuff that's on my hand is known in the industry as HCl insoluble. That means that it won't dissolve in concentrated hot hydrochloric acid. In your stomach, you have 10th normal hydrochloric acid. This stuff will not dissolve in body fluids. It has a biological half-life of about two days, and then it's all gone. Even though it has a radioactive half-life of four billion years. Does it hurt me to eat it? Not at all. Does it hurt the NRC for me, have me eat it? Yeah, it does, because it exposes their fraud. You know what NRC means, don't you? That's the no reactor crowd. The rules are set, the standards are set by the EPA. And let me give you another definition for EPA. It means the end of progress altogether. They say that a hazardous material in any amount located any place must be removed at great public expense. If asbestos causes lung cancer, then you can go in at great public expense and tear it out of your schools, make dust out of it again, when all you had to do was coat it with paint or plastic and leave it there to do its job. How many schools have been torn into just to get rid of asbestos? What then are you going to do with the mountain where this rock came from? It's asbestos. If I flick dust off from it, is it going to cause lung cancer? No, not unless you get it into your lungs repeatedly, time after time. I was in a supply house back east when they were served a federal warrant on a $5 million lawsuit because they had sold tape with asbestos in it to the United States Nuclear Navy. Tell me that lawyers didn't kill the nuclear option. Lead, that stuff they put in gasoline to keep it from knocking, pre-detonating, is harmful in any amount. What are you going to do? When I was just 14 years old, I found this rock 1,400 feet underground in Pioche, Nevada. It's called Galena, just like my first name, only with an A on it. 95% lead. 
Will that hurt you? Not unless it enters your body in a form like this in excess of 2,000 feet per second. It's the suddenness of the impact that makes the difference, not the material. This piece of lead my son took out of a human body and gave to me. That's called dying of lead poisoning. May I submit at this point that the only reportable event are deaths, not fractional deaths, are those from which you recovered. What did we do with those black figures on there that were exposed to unshielded nuclear reactions? What do you do with them in your society? Cross them off? Are they high-level waste? Because they are self-heating, and they were radioactive to a certain extent. The radioactivity could be measured on a Geiger counter. That's how you determine how much medical attention you're going to give them. What are you going to do with the people that survived? What did you do with the 34 people that didn't die? You've never answered that question. Neither has society. The Department of Energy ramrodded the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982 through the United States Congress. It is Public Law 97-425. This requires a mill per kilowatt hour on all nuclear power. That's a dollar per megawatt hour. At Rancho Seco, that means that that's $913 an hour has to go to the Secretary of Energy so that you can research how to throw away plutonium. Now, plutonium is the reason why we built reactors at Hanford in the first place, and it's the reason why I came to California in 1965 to do the detailed design work on this plant, which we later built in Illinois. They told me that I got to build it down at San Luis Obispo, and that's how they got me away from Hanford in the first place. But we didn't get to build it at San Luis Obispo. We built it at Morris, Illinois. Why do you build plants like this? Obviously, to recover plutonium from the uranium matrix in which it is created. The federal government right now has said that you got to bury this stuff 3,200 feet deep in solid rock. And they've got contests going on between states to find out whether you're going to bury it in basalt or granite or salt. Somebody's stupid. Do you suppose it is stupidity? Or do you suppose it is a plot? I suspect it's a plot. For 57 years out of my life, I thought that I could make this thing come up right because I was right and for no other reason. And then there was a neat little guy from Germany, Hans Phillips, who was drafted into the German army when he was 15 and drafted into our army when he was 25. And he got hold of me one day and he set me down and he taught me a few basics about the difference between a democracy and a republic. I didn't really understand because I was just a neutron mechanic that knew how to make plutonium out of uranium. And Hans Philip got my attention. About the time he got my attention and after I'd had time for it to soak in, there was another guy came on the scene. His name's Alan Stang. And he came into my home and I was trying to convince Alan about what I knew and he was trying to tell me what to do about it and we did this for three hours and finally Alan says, Galen, I know the answer to your problem. What is it, Alan? He says, easy, go on lecture tour for American Opinion Speakers Bureau, and by the time you get done, you'll have it figured out. Thanks a lot, Alan. <laughs> Goodbye. And well, Alan Stang's a neat guy, and he doesn't give up easily, not even on characters like me. And one day, my wife said to me, aren't you glad that we are not our grandchildren? I said, what'd you say, woman? Say it again. So she did. Aren't you glad that we're not our grandchildren? Now, I've got five of the neatest grandchildren in the whole world. They're the cutest, best behaved, 
neatest little grandchildren you've ever seen. The youngest, you know what her first word that she ever spoke was? Grandpa. Do you think she can get me to do what she wants me to do? When she was two and a half, she came up and I was resting in my chair and she grabbed me by the finger and she says, Grandpa, vroom, vroom. I says, Ariel, it's 10 o'clock at night. No, we're not going on the motorcycle. And she grabbed me by the finger and says, Grandpa, vroom, vroom. Five minutes later, we were going down the street and she was honking the horn on that 550 Honda and happy as could be. Why was she honking the horn? So that the neighbors would know that she had her grandfather in tow at 10 o'clock at night. I would do anything in the world for my grandchildren. Even call Joe Mertens and tell him that I would go on lecture to her for American Opinion Speakers Bureau. It's not easy to go on lecture to her. They keep me away from home for three, four, five weeks at a time and they don't think anything of it. And guys like Tom Gow, you know what he did to me the other day? He put me on the air with Jim Eason on KGO and he sat there and smiled all the time that he did it. <laughs> now he presumed that I could get myself out of trouble, keep myself out of trouble with Jim Eason. That's not easy. <laughs> you heard the story in the Bible about Daniel being thrown to the lion's den? That isn't what Tom Gow does. He throws Gail into Jim Eason. Well, it works. If you know what you're talking about, if you have truth as a weapon, there's no problem. Truths, dose rates that deposit ultraviolet energies on the skin won't burn you and keep your blood from repairing any damage done to the skin. Now, my neighbor, John Nelson, is a really fine radio microbiologist. He found out that if you shield some of the rats' tails with lead and put the, all of the rats in the same radiation field, that the rats that weren't shielded die and the ones that had lead-shielded tails live. You're going to have to think about that one for a while, and while you're thinking about it, I'm going to go on. Before we had instruments, we used to work until we got burned. And we used to go to first aid every once in a while and we'd hold our hands out like this. And if the nails weren't shriveling a little bit, and wrinkling a little bit, why they'd say, okay, go back to work. Before we had instruments. After we got instruments, then we had to keep the two tenths of an hour per day standard. Let's talk about something else. Why do we have these absurd standards? I'm going to explain it very quickly to you. It can be summarized by this statement. Who owns the plutonium and how much is it worth? Right now the utilities own the plutonium inventory. The federal government would like to take it away from them and it really belongs to the ratepayer who has to pay for its mining, fabrication into fuel, operation in a reactor to get electricity, and now the federal government wants to throw it away at a cost of $300,000 a ton just to encapsulate it and throw it away into the soil. Without the tribute that's being paid of a dollar per megawatt hour. Do you see that three-way struggle that's going on for the plutonium inventory of the country? Well, let's recap quickly. You're paying too much because of absurd regulations. Public concerns are unjustified. The only reportable incidents are deaths. Fractional deaths don't count. The only hazard is from atomic blasts, unshielded nuclear reactions, and doctors who have a license to burn. You are being confused into throwing away resources by calling them waste. The solution, get the government out of the energy business. What can you do about it? You can uh, write to your congressman and tell him that you're not happy that nuclear reactors are not run with greater than 100% availability. 
you're unhappy because it takes Diablo Canyon 17 years to be completed. They didn't complete Diablo Canyon once, they completed it three times. And there was a moving regulatory standard. Tell him you're unhappy about moving regulatory standards. Now, if you need uh, information why you uh, reference some of the things that Galen does, but you don't have to have my expertise. You can take a trim bulletin and wave it under their nose. Now, if their voting record is good, like Stumps was in Arizona, he had a 100% conservative index. He liked trim bulletins around where he was when he came back into his district. But Mo Udall, who was the guy that originated that Nuclear Waste Policy Act with a voting index of four, he gets red in the face. You understand the difference? Mo Udall does now too. When you get around to replacing guys like Mo Udall with somebody like Stump, and I don't know your congressman's name, but if he has less than 100% on the voting index, he can do better, and you use a trim bullet to get him to do better. Yeah, you can do that. You can understand that some of these things like it's all just an inventory control game, who owns the PU and how much is it worth, there are no nuclear waste, just transuranics, to be recovered and fishing products to be used beneficially in things like preserving food. Do you know that you can preserve a steak two inches thick wrapped in saran wrap? You can set it on a desk for eight years and when you eat it without refrigeration after this period of time, you cook it and it's delicious and it's not spoiled. Do you know that you could irradiate packaged cracked crab out of Alaska in a gamma field in what you do to the refrigeration market. What you'd have is irradiators instead of refrigerators and that the crab wouldn't spoil on the shelf. Do you know that in Europe you can go down and get a gallon of milk at the store and keep it without refrigeration for six weeks without it spoiling because it's been through a gamma radiator? Do you know that 45% of the power in France comes from nuclear reactors? and that over 40% of the homes in Sweden are heated with district urban heating where nuclear reactors provide the heat. And what do we do with that heat? We waste it in cooling towers. Public utilities are useful only if they can produce power cheaper than local power generators. And so the answer is obvious. We each have the same kind of a power plant that's in a nuclear submarine sitting right in the middle of our cities. And we use them. And we don't ask the government if we can turn it on or turn it off or how much it power costs. We have our own. Who doesn't want you to do it right now? And I'll say large public utilities. Ridiculous. We're already enslaved. Get the government out of its cartel out of its monopoly. It has no business being there. Fusion is a false hope. How much is the first megawatt of electricity cost out of fusion? How many billions of dollars for one megawatt? Sacramento Mud. Rancho Seco. You've got a reactor 913 megawatt. You've got nine acres of solar panels that have a maximum capacity of one megawatt. As compared to 913 over here, no, it's not even that. The availability factor on the solar panels is 7.4%. 7.4% of one megawatt is 74 kilowatts and it cost $12 million to put that thing in, and they say we add it to the peaking power capacity of that plant. 
If it were online at one megawatt, how much percentage-wise have they added to the generating capacity of that plant? Less than running that reactor, two-tenths of a percent over its rated power. In other words, you could just crank up that plant just a little bit and totally negate that solar input. Do they tell you that? Uh-uh. Who pays for it? They said because the $12 million, most of the $12 million came from the federal coffers that the people in California didn't have to pay for it. If you believe that, I've got a bridge up in Washington that I'll sell you too. Up in Washington, they built the first reactor on the bend in the Columbia River in 12 months, and it had never been done before. From sagebrush and sand in September 1943 to nuclear steam in October 1944. And we recovered enough plutonium in the Manhattan Project to meet the weapons needs, plutonium weapons needs of the country for the expected future 10 times over by 1965. All the time that we were doing this, we were shipping all of our technology all of the materiel to Russia via Fairbanks, Alaska, Great Falls, Montana, in U.S. Air Force planes in 1944 under the auspices of Harry Hopkins and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it makes me hurt inside when I see guys right now prosecuted, run out in front of the public for sale, selling naval secrets to the Russians when in this case, I think they just gave them away. The President of the United States, Major Jordan's diary. Have you read it? Don't walk out of the room without a copy if you haven't read it. OK. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to think? One thing, you go to a reactor for safety and food preservation for protection. Don't get caught evacuating like the NRC wants you to do unless you can do it in 10 seconds. Because unless you can get cover in about 10 seconds, it's not going to do any good when you see that bright flash. Is fallout going to hurt you? No. Nope. And if you haven't been burned, what's your problem? You're going to stand around and complain about detectable radioactivity? If you run all of the big nuclear power plants in this country at greater than 100% availability, guess what the big public utilities would have to do? They'd have to have a sale on electricity. And so what you can do is petition Congress for immediate rate decrease to one cent per kilowatt hour as a starter, free from public utility control. How many of you recall the scripture, Ezekiel 33? You post a watchman on the wall, and if he sees a threat coming, and he sounds the alarm, and the people hearing the alarm do nothing, and they die in their sins, their blood will be upon their own head. But if the watchman fails to sound the trumpet, and the people die in the sin, their sins, then their blood will be required upon the head of the watchman. If I am a watchman, and I am, guess what I just made you? Watchman too. May I suggest that you have not met your commitment as watchman until you've warned as many people as I have here tonight. 